I don't think God would last in jail. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Not well. That's a lot of him on him, I guess. I think that's everyone's fear. I miss your eyes. Your nose. I like yours. That's crooked. Maybe I can get beat up in here and someone will punch it so hard it fixes itself. Sheriff's office, anybody inside? No, the president's making himself known. I love you and I miss you. Stop. <laughs> Love you. Thursday, July 1st, 2021, wasn't unlike any other in the Halderson household in Windsor, Wisconsin. Living inside the home was 50-year-old Bart Halderson, his wife, 53-year-old Krista, and their youngest son, 23-year-old Chandler. Chandler was a hard-working, live-in college student with an exciting life and an extremely bright future. He was pursuing an IT degree at Madison Technical College, was a member of a police scuba diving team, a young employee at an insurance company, and had a job waiting for him at Elon Musk's prestigious company, SpaceX, upon graduating. He was, by all accounts, an overachiever, and his parents couldn't have been more proud. Chandler also liked to cook, and on the evening of the first, he'd made a pasta with scampi sauce dinner for his parents. Following dinner, he helped them gather and pack up tools and luggage in preparation for their 4th of July getaway. His parents had informed him over dinner that they were going on a weekend trip up to their family's cabin, three hours away in the woods of Langlade County. During the day, Chandler had noticed his father take a bank-wrapped stack of cash out of the safe in the basement. He'd also seen that his parents had taken a handful of bottles from the liquor cabinet. He'd noted both of these things as odd, but didn't think too much of it. After helping them get their belongings together, the three enjoyed some television before they all headed to bed. That would be the last time Chandler would see his parents alive. The next morning, Friday, July 2nd, Chandler's parents took off for the cabin before he awoke. Chandler enjoyed a day of peace and quiet until that afternoon there came a knock at the door. It turned out to be a co-worker of Krista's. She hadn't shown up or called out of work that day, which was extremely unusual behavior for her. The colleague had tried contacting her by phone, but to no avail, so he'd come by to make sure she was okay. Chandler told him that his mom and dad had been preparing for a trip up to the family cabin and had left that morning. With everything going on, she'd probably forgotten to call out. Slightly relieved, her co-worker left, but kept in touch with Chandler over the weekend to make sure that Krista made it back safe. However, when Krista didn't come to work or call out that Monday or Tuesday, her co-worker had a gut feeling that something was wrong and encouraged Chandler to go to the police. When they still hadn't come home by Wednesday, July 7th, Chandler took his advice and filed a missing persons report to the Dane County Sheriff's Office. He advised police that his parents had been driven up to the cabin by a mysterious couple. After leaving the police station, Chandler began desperately reaching out to people by phone and going door to door around his neighborhood, asking everyone if they'd heard from his parents. However, no one had seen or heard anything. The next day, July 8th, Chandler's brother Mitchell and his fiance met police officers at the family cabin to search the premises for Bart and Krista. But instead, they discovered something rather odd. We probably could get in if you wanted us to. I, obviously, there'd be some damage. We'd mm -hmm. try to minimize it as best we could. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, no, I think that honestly at least makes sense at this point. Sheriff's office, anybody inside? No, it's the president's making himself known. There were no suitcases or possessions inside the cabin. Surfaces were covered in layers of dust, and it didn't look as if anything had been moved or even touched. It was clear that no one had been inside at any point in the recent past. 
With nowhere else to turn, police summon Chandler, as well as his girlfriend, Kat, down to the police station in the hopes of uncovering some more details that would help them locate his missing parents. Kat's demeanor at being taken to the station is very different compared to Chandler's. Oh my god, you can see me? So I'm not gonna lie, if you hear me burping, I have a very sensitive stomach. Oh. Is it true that the back seats are weather just in case people throw up or pee back here? <laughs> oh, we're good. Boys are always so monotone, stubborn. Don't want to talk about Sue Magnolias. You just call me a suspect. Oh, we both really like Star Wars. <laughs> the following interrogation footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed attorney, a licensed clinical psychologist, a former licensed professional counselor, and a licensed professional counselor. So, Brian Trump, Detective Dan County Sheriff's Office, we spoke yesterday. Yeah, uh, Mayor Holder, sir. Yep. So, obviously, we're we're here. We want to talk a little bit about uh, your parents going missing, right, Chris and Bart? Um, before we get started, just because you're up here, okay? So, I'm just going to read you your constitutional rights. Okay, so it's a Dan County issued card that they give us. Um, so I'll just read them to you right off the card, okay? The detective's decision to read directly from the note card, despite Shirley having committed the Miranda rights to memory, could be to emphasize to Chandler that being Mirandized is just a formality and nothing he needs to think too hard about. After Chandler has read his Miranda rights, the detectives jump directly into questioning. In missing persons cases especially, it's important that investigators work with a sense of urgency. Each minute that passes makes it less likely that the victims will be found alive. However, not taking the time to develop rapport with someone can lead to their anxiety level remaining high, which would make them more closed off. Taking a few minutes to put someone at ease and try to connect with them can end up saving a lot of time in the long run. So you, you reported your parents missing. We got some information from you yesterday. So I, I guess if you want to start with, let's just go back to to last Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday. I was with my dad. Yeah, I remember it. It was kind of a bad day. Okay. And why was it a bad day? I tossed the ball, and I smashed the glass. Okay. With the dog. The dog was out. Uh, that, yeah, set my dad off, and we tried to clean it up. Okay. I don't know about him, but I got injured. Um, but he was mad. He didn't really talk to me too much that day. detective at my house said something's happened and while we were leaving people were going inside is there a warrant for my house can uh, I go in uh, officer yeah um, what are they up to can you hear that what are they up to uh, my I guess, guess is they, they want to just, just ask some more follow-up questions, questions and stuff. No, they they went into the house. Uh, uh, they went to the house. They just went behind it. Uh, Officer Haley just like walked pretty much in to the gate. You know, the gate on the outside. She just kind of walked in. I was, I was wondering. If Everything's okay because she said something's happened. Okay. And we need to go down. Alright. I'll find out what that's about. Well, has anything bad happened? Sorry. Not sure. It's definitely strange that Chandler would suddenly inquire about a warrant. He looks at the detective with a more stern countenance when asking this question and makes what appears to be direct and sustained eye contact. While sustained eye contact is more of a sign of dishonesty rather than honesty, and looking away periodically can be due to accessing memories, Chandler's almost constant looking away is atypical behavior and suspicious. Just like how his sustained eye contact is a red flag, the awkward, sustained, almost complete lack of eye contact would raise concerns. Here, his eye contact has nothing to do with trying to look open and honest and everything to do with seeking out any emotions or clues in the officer's face as he responds. 
For now, they shift their focus back to getting a timeline for what Chandler did on Thursday, July 1st, the last day he'd seen his parents. Um, it's Thursday morning. I wake up. I kind of just stay in my room on my phone. Um, help my mom out getting her in. In the morning, she, she left for work at 7.30. His hand covers both sides of his face and he rubs his chin. These are typically self-soothing behaviors, which aren't unusual for a situation like this. Most people in Chandler's position would be anxious. The pressure from the rubbing is comforting, and his hand and arm serve as a subconscious barrier between him and the detective he's talking to. Chandler speaks very slowly, even when describing routine activities like helping his mom with chores before work. He appears to be thinking a lot and often stares blankly at the floor, as if in a daze. This is a common symptom of emotional cutoff, which results when a person is under high stress or has experienced a traumatic event. Emotional cutoff is an adaptive response that allows a person to better cope with intense situations without falling apart or having an emotional breakdown. Since Chandler was frequently with his girlfriend Kat since Friday, detectives are interviewing both so they can uncover any inconsistencies between their stories. If their recounts of the past weekend don't match up, the two are going to have a huge problem. Oh, there's a boo bear? All right, you can play your video. Uh, 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 my arm. All right. Okay. Oh, you okay if you want to. Her response to seeing the stuffed animal, then proceeding to cuddling with it on the couch as if she's lounging around her own home, may be indicators of emotional immaturity. When someone doesn't show an appropriate level of concern during an investigation, detectives can interpret this as a red flag. Kat sits alone in the interrogation room for about 20 minutes, looking as if she's battling fatigue. Detectives finally enter, introduce themselves, and make her a generous offer in the hopes she lets her guard down. Hi. So this is George. He's one of my partners. Hi. I think I need the one that you spoke with me yesterday. He's off today, so you get George. I don't know if you're hungry, buy you two cookies. Is there chocolate? One has chocolate, one doesn't. I wish it's chocolate. Are you really? If I eat it, I'll just put that stuff on it. Oh, please don't. There's a, there's a, there's an emotional one also on it, so. I think, I know one sprinkles, but you know what? I can put them here if you want it, you want it. That one has chocolate. This one? This one. I don't know. It feels like. Uh, you sure if you want that one? Cat seems to be in a much softer interrogation room than Chandler. Soft interrogation rooms come from a trauma-informed perspective. When family members, children, or victims of assault need to be questioned by police, they may feel safer doing so in a space that feels comfortable, especially compared to a bare interrogation room. In a regular interrogation room, detectives want the suspect to rely on them to provide comfort, such as compliments, food, cigarettes, attention, rather than the room itself providing comfort. So... Some of it is going to be repeat. I just want to make sure that I'm really understanding everything. So, again, give me your time. My time Thursday. Thursday at work. Um, that's when Chandler told me, I think it was Thursday, that his parents were going on up to the cabin um, with some friends. So he was going to be at the house with the dogs by himself all weekend. Um... Went to sleep. Friday morning, I woke up. They had left with the stuff that was all set out. I uh, remembered the cast. All right, so Friday during the day, I just played video games, kind of. Yeah, then after work, I believe that was the day Kat came over. After whose work? Kat, she had oh, five. Her work. Five was her work when okay. she was off. I she came over. She, um, I believe she stayed with me on that couch that night. Woke up, got ready for work, went to work. Um, uh, we planned that I was going to go over there and spend the night. 
um, just hang out with him and the dogs. Okay, so you went to East Target, so you went from Hilldale to East Target? To East, to my mom's house, to grab the hydrogen peroxide and the Swiffer because Chandler broke the glass of the fireplace and cut his toe, so we had one to clean that and then clean up the glass and blood. You've probably noticed that Kat is eating her cookie extremely slowly. This is significant because if you remember, when the detectives first offered Kat the cookies, she told them that she has a chocolate allergy. She claimed that she'll violently throw up if she eats it. However, between the sprinkle cookie and the chocolate chip cookie, she chose the chocolate one. This may explain why she's holding on to it for so long and taking such tiny bites. She could be trying to avoid the chocolate or ingest only little bits of it at a time. You'll later see throughout the interview that she pauses multiple times, reporting the urge to vomit. Her choice to take the chocolate cookie, though, was unusual and could be a possible indication of attention-seeking behaviors. So, then to Cambridge. And then... I was there, and then I left... In the morning, because you want to do chores, and then I know what time I around what time I was home. So picture, and so on Saturday, I was with my dog at eight fifty three a.m. So did you see um, the fireplace? Hmm? What did it look like? Like broken? It was like one pane, I think, on the left side. And did you see, like, the blood in the glass? Was that all picked up? It was pretty much all picked up, except, like, a little bit of glass was still there. Um, honestly, I didn't see, like, a lot of blood, but probably because it was only a cut on his big toe. Okay. Can I see it again? The blood was by the fireplace, I assume? Hmm? The blood was by the fireplace? I think so. I didn't, like, see it, you know? Oh, you didn't see the blood? Oh. Honestly, I didn't see, like, a lot of blood, but... It's Sunday. It's the 4th. In the morning, I'm a little worried about my family. I think I called my mom. Oh, it's rough. I've called. I, I don't know the time stuff. Throughout the weekend, I mean. But I called my mom, I believe. In the morning, there's a lot of those lines, and I get a text from her. It was a text message. It wasn't even an iMessage, message. So mm -hmm. I assume she said white leg today. So she sent it that day. Chandler makes notably little eye contact with either officer throughout his explanation of his weekend. Occasionally breaking eye contact is a typical sign of one's attempt to access memories. But Chandler is mostly staring down and away from detectives, only looking up at them every now and then. Also, the way Chandler backtracks here sounds as if he made a mistake by indicating to detectives that he only contacted his mother on July 4th. He felt the need to clarify his statement, a sign that there's something of possible interest here. I called Dan that Sunday, asked him what, he, what he's up to, or if he wants to hang out. I, I don't like being alone at the house very much. Dan is mom's co-worker slash friend? Yeah, he's okay. guy. He invited me for fireworks in his, his driveway. No, this is Sunday. This is Sunday. So I went to Kat's house to eat, but we ended up not eating there. We went to um, Chris's house. Kat and I rushed back to my house, let the girls out. And we go back straight to the farm. The farm is Cress's home and property. It's a large plot of land that features Cress's house, fields of crops and plants, a big barn, and an above-ground swimming pool that Chandler and Kat frequently use. After enjoying a meal at the farm, the couple traveled back to Chandler's house around 7 p.m. They fed his dogs and took them outside, tackled a couple other small chores, then they made their way to Dan's house to light fireworks and spend the 4th of July holiday together. After a fireworks show that nearly caused a bushfire, the pair decided it was time to call it a night. They went back to Chandler's house and fell asleep together around 10 p.m. 
Kat tells investigators much of the same thing about her holiday. So when you say you went home, you went to... Mom's. Your mom's? Yes. Okay. Cat corroborates Chandler's story. Cat shows detectives a video of Chandler that's timestamped on July 4th. And then he left around 6.30 because he had to be home before 8 to feed the dogs their dinner. And so we left around 6.30, probably got to like the, my mom's house. Um, there's a garbage or a bathroom. Just think I look really sus if I stand up and run out of here. <laughs> I'm not trying to get tackled. I'm, I'm not going to tackle you. No. You go, you too. Oh. Okay. okay. After enjoying fireworks at Dan's house, then going back to Chandler's for the night, the two woke up together Monday morning. Cat left for work shortly before 8 a.m., Chandler supposedly spent the morning playing video games and watching TV. He then made a rather spontaneous visit to the farm by himself. Well, at the end of the day on Monday, I did go for the afternoon. I did go to the farm to talk to Chris and Kat's mom. I told them what's happening with my health because I had the appointment at 2. Did you go to the farm before or after? After, because I told them what happened to me. And I told them the legs are probably going to be permanent and the headaches should be fixed after the hemorrhage is cleared a little bit. Chandler is speaking like someone who's trying to jog their memory. He must know that the interrogation isn't some sort of memory test, but he seems keen on recalling every detail perhaps hoping that providing such detail will mean that he won't be considered a suspect. An innocent person would reasonably want to cough up as much information as possible. However, focusing on details could also be Chandler's way of diffusing any stress or anxiety he's feeling. Sunday. Sunday. So you were swimming. Um, what were you having a breakdown about? Do you ever have I don't even know if they're done getting like as bad as they, they can be yet. So yeah, it's a, that's not fun. And you, I think you were telling me last night it was, it's, it's a symptom of a concussion, right? So that right? that's not it. That's a, it's a symptom of nerve damage from the hip oh, in my spine. So it's okay. permanent. Okay. I understand that. No, it's better. Yeah. I go to dinner at Fat. Cat's house on the east side. Okay. What time do you think that was? It's going to be 7.30. I left the farm. I think we just eat and cuddle a little bit. Okay. Can I go home? So, I'm doing good. So, I'll let you keep going. I really try to remember things. Um, and then... Sunday, woke up, got ready. Okay. Sunday or Monday? Monday, sorry. Okay. Left around 7.40 because I took a picture at 7.33 of us. Then I went to work. I don't know if you want to see a picture of me at my job because I took a picture. In the hazardous section. In the hazardous medication. So far, Kat comes across as open and forthcoming with detectives. She answers all of their questions in detail and offers up photos and timestamps readily and frequently without being asked. On the other hand, this does all seem a tad convenient. This behavior seems unusual but may indicate her willingness to be cooperative. From there, I went to my mom's house because Tamara went to the farm because uh, my mom's fiance lets him walk in the pool because that's one of the things we did Sunday because it helps stretch out his legs, make him feel better because I also help stretch his legs on Friday um, because he has some like some, some tired numbness, that's the word and then um, from his fall he had a couple weeks back From there, Kat's account of Monday night mimics Chandler's They met up at Kat's mom's house sometime around 8pm 
ate dinner, and watched TV together. Then Chandler left, and they spent the night in their respective homes. We pick our tail back up on Tuesday morning. Dan is worried about my mom on Tuesday, I think. He called and said no, no word. My mom, I don't know if he called or texted. I think he just contacted so they can think. Of. Reached out. Yeah, he reached out. Then I'm like, oh, it's Tuesday morning. They should be here. Um, no word. I think I called my mom that day. So from the time like they left, did you talk to them at all when they were? I got a text. Uh, you got the one text that yeah. I that you mentioned earlier. Don't even like it, right? Yeah, it's, that was it. Nothing else. Yeah. So that's that's fishy to me. Even the text because I realized Memorial Day is when the White Lake Parade is. Oh sure. There's no Fourth of July. Maybe there's cheap drinks, but there's no parade at okay. White Lake on the Fourth. Then I started trying to get the, the glass. So I feel a little lazy on the glass. I just kind of had chairs in front of it. My blood was kind of on the floor, so I got the Swiffer I borrowed from Kat. I Swiffered the, the floor floor. And then I got a little bit in the kitchen. And then everywhere kind of I walked, pretty much. The, the bathroom, the kitchen. And then uh, I, I couldn't get the carpet, so I still stained that up through a crappy. While it's possible that the bloody toe and the explanation behind it are all true, traces of blood at a crime scene are always a red flag to law enforcement. They'll likely be checking out these stains in order to gauge whether they really might have come from a cut, or if they were clearly caused by something else. One must wonder if Chandler has ever heard of a Band-Aid. And I just tried to stop all the bleeding, but I, you know, it wouldn't stop. So mm -hmm. that blood was all coming from your left foot. Yeah, left foot hole. Left foot hole. Yeah. I mean, we're talking. Are we talking massive amounts of blood? Are we talking, you know, a little bit? Like the scrum, it started as drops until I got to the bathroom. And then I got back to go grab my sock and some of the, uh, the paper towel. And I see the glasses in there, so I grab a tweezer and I pull it out. And then it starts squirting out. And I, I got some, uh, a little bit of the rock. It wasn't that bad of the rock. But it, um, I think the worst was the that floor. That, like it kind of like... You know, like this lid puddles. Mm -hmm. It was it wasn't good. We got in the floor down in the basement. Well, that one. Um, and then I go upstairs to the kitchen. And it's still going, and I'm trying to get my foot in the sink just to slow it down and pinch it, maybe. Chandler continues with a highly detailed account of his every move. He's sticking to his strategy of providing a description of every single step. However, his constricted emotions and facial expressions make it difficult to read whether this is a symptom of anxiety or a genuine attempt to be helpful. Let's work today from 30 minutes. 12.30. That's fine. Okay. I'm an emotional person. Because we cry about my boyfriend's parents are missing. Like, I, I think it's more concerning if I wasn't concerned. I'm a very emotional person. Like, I cry enough for both of us is, like, what I like to say. Sure. Like, it's like I hang out with the family often, you know. There's parents. They're important. As far as the blood on your foot, um, how did you clean that up? So we, we were talking, you got, you had blood on Swiffer wet set. Okay, Swiffer wet set. And where did you get that from? Chad, let me borrow it. Um, where is it at now? Uh, I returned it to Cat. And did you use anything else? Hydrogen peroxide for the, the tiles from the hard floors. Um, just the big globs needed a little bit. Hydrogen peroxide. Did that seem to help get rid of the blood? Well, it hurt my foot. Uh, that stuff, um, but it didn't really help. Okay. It kind of just made a mess. Well, when I had some blood on the basement, I used the peroxide. 
Okay. Basement floor and tiles in the kitchen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got excited. There, it wasn't as much. Like, there were, like, this size pools in the kitchen. Okay. I was pinching it pretty dang hard. And did you clean up at all when it actually happened? You know, my dad was furious. So, uh, so he, he did stuff to clean it. Yeah. I don't know what he did. But I, he sent me to my room upstairs and he did whatever he did, but it still was on the floor after he was done. Okay. Did your dad get injured at all when the glass broke? Did he step on any of Did he send me up? But I, I don't doubt it. If he gets mad, he's not thinking. So uh, we don't know if your dad got hurt? No. Okay. No. Yeah. My best guess is that guy reached in the fireplace and cut of his arm or something. I don't know. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, head pain? Do you guys have like Tylenol or something? I, I know you guys can't really yeah, offer anything yeah. like that. But like a headache? Yeah, I've been getting the migraines from all of the, the hits and stuff. Most people wouldn't dare to make a joke about their missing loved one being hurt out of fear and concern that they actually could be. Chandler's amusement about his dad getting cut will certainly be noted by detectives as a red flag. To be fair, it's possible that Chandler is just the type of person who uses inappropriate humor to cope with stress or anxiety. However, when it's discovered what lay among the ashes of the Halderson's fireplace, you'll look back on this comment with a bit more speculation. Then I go to the police station because I ask her, when should I make a thing? A uh, point for it that. Uh, I'm sorry. Don't worry, sir. Wednesday morning, you said you went to the police department? Yeah, to make a. a I'll talk to them about my parents. And um, then I met with three sheriffs. Chandler's show of emotion is sudden and brief. The nature of his display calls into question whether he's trying really hard to keep his composure or whether this short demonstration was merely an affectation. There's also a third theory. Chandler's agitation might not concern his parents' disappearance at all. Chandler was surely trying to say missing persons report but he couldn't seem to remember what it's called, no matter how hard he tried. That's Jonathan. Like I said, he's not really, he expresses it in a different way. It's not like the biggest emotional person, but like, I guess like when I look at him, it's different when other people look at him. Like I can tell it's really hard on him. And like, he just sits there and dissociates and like, cases and like you know it just sits there like where my parents like a shell. Cat also told police that Chandler was trying to keep himself optimistic and saying things like well they're at the cabin they don't get a lot of reception so that's why we haven't talked to them as well as speculating that maybe their phones died and that was why they haven't heard from them. So his brother is there today he leaves to go to the cabin? Yeah which um, but what does Chandler want to do? Does he want to stay in Madison? Does he want to go up to the cabin and help his brother? What's he, was, what's he thinking? I asked him that when I was on the couch. I was like, why, why don't we go up to the cabin? Because like, his fiance and him were going. He's like, well, I can't drive. I'm like, well, I could have drove. He's like, yeah, you could have. He's like, but I don't know if they need me in Madison for questions, which clearly you guys did. And, like, and I also need to be with the dogs. So then I think he went to his neighbors to see if they had, like, any, like, a ring camera. And if there was, like, footage, footage that might have caught the car. And they said they already handed over to the police when he came back. And I was in the backyard playing frisbee with the dogs. Fancy security system. I was wondering if you were able to capture the road or my house. Um, the, uh, the police actually came and, and downloaded everything they have. But it, it's actually my sister's house. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they were here, I think, till like 9 o'clock last night and downloaded all the video she's got. So we're hoping that... Yeah, did it capture anything on... We don't know. We don't know. They just took a copy of everything, and so we're hoping... 
He was definitely concerned based on a call he placed to the sheriff's office before his interrogation. Uh, a little confused. Uh, I got two squads parked right outside my house. And they're not really canvassing, they're just kind of sitting there. Is everything alright? Yeah, I mean, they're in the area doing canvassing, and they're also uh, probably doing a shift change right now, getting our second shift crew on around 3, 3.30. Oh, there's four now. Something going on that we need to know. Do you know of anything? So, I don't know. It's kind of stressful. Sorry, I, so there's nothing new going on? Not that I'm aware of. But in addition to his concern was his notable level of apprehension, and the source behind it would soon be uncovered. Is there any reason to believe mom or dad's blood would be somewhere in the house? Have they been injured at all that you're aware of? Oh, well, my dad scratches his psoriasis till he, like, gushes blood. Okay. Gushing. Um, describe gushing to me. But enough to run down your leg, like, um... Like cover your leg, I suppose, like gaze on his knee. So he does this, it just drips down. Uh, I ask him to stop, but he doesn't do it when he's stressed out. Yeah. He, he just kind of like, it's his tick. He's, yeah, probably itches. My mom's blood, um, just from her bloody nose that she gets sometimes when she wakes up. So that's why we've been doing uh, the dehumidifier, or humidifier and dehumidifiers yeah probably downstairs you get the we, we have to do multiple of them but she can't be in the living room too long because that's a dehumidifier yeah. and if she does her nose gets bad not like a regular one she gets it bad we begin to see some variance in chandler's facial expressions and intonation he's really dramatizing his description of how his parents blood could be present in the home in reality, neither the scratching of the psoriasis nor a nosebleed are enough to produce noticeable pools of blood. He might think he's being helpful and convincing, but he's actually coming off as quite suspicious. The fact that further investigation revealed considerably large traces of blood that had once been on the basement floor inside Chandler's home doesn't help his argument. In fact, it seems as if he might be trying to explain away why there may be a lot of blood found inside his house. So he has a good relationship with mom and dad. Like, he's introverted, like, doesn't want to hang out with his parents. He'd rather video game on his computer. It's a good relationship, I think. No problems that you know of between the three of them. I mean, he owed the money, but he paid them back. I told you that already. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I was blood over during the weekend. But other than that, that's like the only time I've really seen a big problem with them, I guess. So did he, how did that come about? Why was that a big deal? Because I thought yesterday you said that he's old for like rent and Christmas yeah. presents and stuff like that. So why was it those two weeks? Yeah. Because like he was working uh, for American Family at the time and like they just, there was like problems with HR and how they weren't like paying him. And, like, it was, like, they sent it in the mail, sent it to, like, not his address. So he was, like, please cancel that check. Then he, like, tried getting them to, like, deposit it. And then at that point, they owed him, like, a couple thousand dollars because they were so far behind. And then I guess the company that they sent money through was, like, this doesn't seem legit. They thought it was a scam. And so his parents were, like, you got to give us that money because we know you have money. But, and so, yeah, then he paid them. It was just those two weeks that were like, you have, like, strips. It seems odd that Chandler's parents were instantly critical and not more understanding of the problems he was having getting paid. This indicates that there were probably pre-existing issues concerning Chandler and making excuses to not repay his debts. 
Bart and Krista simply could have been drawing the line with Chandler rather than being hard on him. It could also be for this reason that they gave Chandler chores and expected him to cook sometimes. So for the two weeks, was that when he hurt his back when he fell? Yeah, it pretty much started, like, right after he fell. Because, like, they could just say, can't, can't come over. It was a part of, like, the recovery and, like, hey, pay his back. Like, because he had to, he fell down the stairs. They just had twice bruised his ribs. Had to wear, like, a neck brace. They are obviously concerned and didn't want him doing a lot. Do you know when he fell? Yes. June 17th. After, before 1.42, because that's a lot of times pictures taken. Okay. He was just going down the stairs and fell? He was on the phone with his boss, who was telling him to hurry up to his computer, so he was running down the wooden stairs with socks. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm going to ask you a weird question with him falling. He probably was going to the computer, but any kind of violence in the house? No. His dad was downstairs at his computer. He was telling me about, like, hearing Chandler fall. He was like, I saw my computer. It didn't sound bad. And then, like, I got up to, like, check after a while, and, like, he was on the floor. And I was like, okay, Mr. Hollerson. Sure. Yeah. He doesn't say anything about it afterwards. Like, he had really, like... I didn't, ju- I didn't just slip on my socks. I actually, you know, Chandler's clumsy. Okay. It is not the first time he has fallen. He needs, like, a life alert. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've seen one of his many falls. Just this. He really likes his socks. Okay. Socks and long sleeves. Yeah. It's really good. It's good to have a look. Chandler supposedly ran down the wooden staircase in his home while wearing socks causing him to slip and fall down the stairs. He sustained a concussion, bruises to his ribs, and nerve damage resulting from a hit to the upper spine. The concussion alone left him with poor memory recall and trouble processing information quickly, among other lasting symptoms. Because his injuries impacted his cognitive ability, Chandler apparently felt that it would be best to notify his soon-to-be bosses at SpaceX of his accident. As a result... He lost his position at the company. This loss, in combination with the persistent and indefinite discomfort of his injuries, weighed heavily on Chandler, not to mention his parents having gone missing not long after. It certainly sounds like an unfortunate case, and while the circumstances surrounding his termination are disheartening, it seems odd that Chandler would voluntarily give up his dream job, seemingly prematurely. If he really did have his future mapped out and it all hinged on this job, most others wouldn't have given up without a fight. However, Chandler essentially just forfeited his future position. I about Florida. So that's where SpaceX was. That's where he was supposed to go. What was the plan? Go down there? You too? Okay. So what did that mean? Because obviously you have a job here, so did you have a job lined up? Or We're just going to transfer to, um, I'm not trying to say FU, but like FU Florida University, because they also have a pharmacy school down there. So I'm getting Facebook notifications because people are requesting the Dane County Sheriff's, like, notice about them, and we've just been messaging people and, like, People were noticing, like, hey, are you guys okay? And we're just like, repost or tell people. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, first, can go down there. Did you guys have, like, everything lined up? Like, when were you supposed to? Um, she was supposed to leave the Saturday of the fall. So, happened on Thursday, Friday. She's supposed to leave Saturday morning. And then... I was going to leave at the end or middle of August because I wanted to be here for my birthday. Oh, it's a big one. 2000, yeah. Gonna get crunk. The tragic fall ultimately cost him his job and his future among the palm trees. Perhaps this was just a coincidence or even a fateful stroke of bad luck. Or maybe the fall is just a small part of something more convoluted detectives would discover the truth soon enough.
Did you guys have like a place that you were going to, like, did you have everything kind of figured out? Where were you going to stay? Just like apartment building in Titusville. Okay. Did he like already sign the lease and stuff? I think so. Before Chandler lost his job, she was supposed to be moving down to Florida with him in early August. It's odd that her big move across the country was just around the corner, and she had absolutely no idea what apartment they were moving to, and no confirmation that the arrangements were actually in place. Hey, Mitch hasn't been in the cabinet in a while, all right? Today? Oh, well, no, today. Yeah, I couldn't say he's been there. He didn't go last year. Okay. Okay. Does he kind of do his own thing? Or? Um, Mitch hasn't lived with us, or, you know, he's got a family now, a dog, a girlfriend, no kids, but cool. he's kind of, you know, uh, I'm just kind of talking, you know how it is with brothers. Yeah. All that. He's so good, cool. Um, <laughs> got a feeling myself. Yeah. All right. I've started thinking about that myself, and my parents are trying to. Figure that out with me. <laughs> it's normal for a young person to receive help and guidance from their parents, but Chandler sounds more like he needs his parents to hold his hand, which is indicative of severe emotional immaturity. Although many young adults may live at home for a time, they should be working towards financial independence. When someone is happy to mooch off of their parents or another person with no long-term goals for themselves, this can be a red flag. In fact, living a parasitic lifestyle can be a sign of psychopathy. Another sign of Chandler's immaturity was that following his parents' disappearance, it was noted that all the couches in the basement were pushed together, and when he was asked why, Chandler said that he had made himself a fort to sleep in. Can I go under there? I'll that. We got all the background, I think, right? Yeah, I think so. So, I think it's time we start talking about what happened to your parents. They're like a truthful version. Okay. Okay. So, we have like 20 pages of writing. We're going to start with a clean, white piece of paper if you start telling the truth. Okay. Because, listen, listen to me. Confronted with a change in the detectives' tactics, Chandler immediately sits up and leans away from the detectives. The detective's choice to cut Chandler off before he could say anything is actually a move taken straight from the Reed technique. In this style of interrogation, the detectives are advised to immediately cut off any attempts to lie so as not to allow the suspect to entrench themselves in that lie. In this case, detectives knew Chandler's first instinct would be to try to scramble his way out of this and quickly shut him down. Is he being interviewed too or is he done? I honestly, I'm with you, so I don't know. You have my attention. There you go. There you go. <laughs> With all this questioning, Kat must be adding things up and possibly realizing that Chandler may be a suspect. If she isn't concerned by now, she definitely should be. This is the only chance you're going to have to tell us the truth. Okay. okay. What we, listen, listen. I'm, I can't tell you what we know, but we know you're not telling us the truth. We know your parents are no longer with us. Okay. And we know the reason why. Chandler appeared taken aback by the detective statement that his parents were no longer alive. This is less likely shock at finding out that his parents are dead and more likely the realization that the jig is up. Officers actually do have proof of his involvement in what really happened to Bart and Krista. Unfortunately, the clues the police managed to dig up tell a morbid tale of the happy couple's last moments. Chandler isn't the only one under suspicion. After all, Kat was with him frequently throughout the weekend. If detectives were also able to find proof of Kat's involvement, she might have a similar conversation waiting around the corner for her. One reason the investigators may be suspicious of her is that while Kat's mother Dolce was a trainee at a public safety commission, she was overheard talking on the phone to her daughter. The instructors at the event claimed that they heard Dolce say to Kat, but you were not home that night. It's unclear exactly which night they were referring to, but the instructors allege that they may have heard Kat reply something along the lines of, just tell them I was home last night. Thinking this was odd, the instructors asked Dolce what was going on, and she repeatedly told them she was home, she was home. It's important to note that it can't be confirmed what was actually said on the phone call. 
Still, the instructors told the police what they believed they had overheard. Let's check back in on Kat's interview. So you've been at the house during the renovations. Uh, so there's a lot going on at the house. What is um what is the smell like in the house? Dog. Okay. Like when they were working on the basement walls, you could like kind of smell the dusty okay smell. There's a fiery smell on Friday because when he broke the um, when the last thing on the fireplace, like ash, was like exposed. Yeah. Okay. The pungent smell of fire is an important observation as it indicates that the fireplace was actually used not long before she was there. Does Cameron talk about any um, firearms that he has? His friend did gift him one. Okay. What is it? I don't know what it's called. But other than that, his parents, they have like a safe with other guns. Because he used to be on the shooting team in college. Okay, you need to tell the truth. There's... Listen, listen, you need to tell the truth about what happened and just tell us why it happened. Okay? If something happened, if you were defending yourself or if you just got fed up with stuff, you need to tell us the truth. Okay? Chandler exhibits a significant amount of anchor points shifting here, indicating that the detective's pressure is starting to make him feel anxious. This is an important cue to the detectives that if they keep pushing, he may get to a point where he will open up and be honest soon. This is your chance to tell us why. Okay? I'm not BSing you. Okay? So can we do that? Okay. They're okay. Um, uh, we'll wait. I'm sorry. Say the next thing. We'll wait. Okay. Because... Chandler has clearly just invoked his right to counsel. The questioning at this point needs to stop. He seems to have resorted to asking for counsel because he was being confronted with evidence contrary to his statements. Sorry, did you find out that the parents were Nah, but they were late. Did he tell you? Yeah, we text like all the time, or Snapchat all the time, not all the times. And I was like, hey, like, have you heard from them? He's like, no, not yet. I'm like, okay, well, has Mitch heard from them? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, um, okay, well, you should maybe ask Mitch. He's like, I don't want to make him worry. I'm like, well, even just ask, like, hey, his mom sent you pictures of the cabin or anything. And I'm like, Tuesday, it was like, so I haven't heard anything. He was like, yeah, no, I'm going to go to the police tomorrow. And then he went to the police on Wednesday. You were going to try to call them? Yeah, he tried to call them. Like, he called his mom in front of me at one point and went straight to voicemail. Okay. Do you know what day that was? Just sometime this weekend. Mm-hmm. Okay. Kat tries numerous times to present Chandler in a favorable light. She mentions that it was his idea to call the police and that he tried calling his mom in front of her. Despite the type of questions she's being asked about him, she seems to be standing by his side, even at the point where the detective's questions are getting more intense and implying foul play on Chandler's part. But unbeknownst to her, detectives are already on his tail. Okay. Okay, can you know what happened? We're not going to tell you what happened. You know what happened. You were there when it happened. We're not BSing you, okay? I wasn't there when it happened. Okay. We know more than you think we know. Yeah. There's people that have told us things. We have, we have evidence. We have proof. We have more set. Okay. So your parents never made it to the cabin, and I think you know that. Okay, so you're asking for an attorney, and we're not going to ask any more questions. Instead of doing a stand up, you just come over here for me. Do you have any in your pockets at all? No, just a wallet to just put in there. Hey, okay. 
Despite the interrogation ending, Chandler still had something disturbing to say after he was handcuffed. He told the officer escorting him from the room that, quote, you don't know the whole story and that he didn't feel bad about what I did. When the officer asked what he meant by that, he didn't respond. You don't think he had anything to do with his mom and dad being unheard from? No. I just, no. All my friends I've talked to, they're like, no, not can right no. Like, that would be crazy. Sorry, I'm very monotone right now, but like, no. Kat appears to have no doubt of her boyfriend's innocence, but maybe she just doesn't know him as well as she thinks she does. In the weeks following this interview, Chandler's darkest secrets would come to light. Secrets pertaining to more than just his parents' disappearance. But for now, detectives must get to the bottom of what happened to Bart and Krista, and quickly. And his brother Mitchell, you think? Mitchell? Yeah, he's... <laughs> A leaf in the wind. Okay. Even if he tried, they could just like push him over and he'd like break. Kat immediately furrowed her brow when detectives asked her if she thinks Chandler had some role in his parents' death, indicating stress and discomfort with the question. After all, compare that reaction to her reaction when she was asked about Mitch. Rather than furrowing, her eyebrows raised, which generally indicates surprise. She even seems amused by the suggestion. It's so unbelievable to her. She also keeps repeating no when they suggest Chandler's involvement. It can often be interpreted as a red flag when someone repeats something over and over, as repetition can be a way to build credibility. However, in this case, Kat may be responding to her own inner dialogue. The thoughts that must be running through her head are unfathomable. And it's almost like she's trying to convince herself that there's no way he could be capable of that. Is that your farm? Is he, you guys explore the time, or is he walking around the property at all? Mm, I mean, we went on walks together, but walking's hard for him. Sure. It's not like he could run away and I wouldn't see him. But we were on each other the whole time. On Monday, he said he walked off by himself, but he was going to cry, so. I'm ready to walk off by myself. Have a little cry? Yeah. A little cry, son. I was upset about if Mom had texted him on Sunday saying that... The job thing still. Oh, the job thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. And when did he find out about the job? Was that Monday? Yes. Okay. It was right after his appointment. Because they, like, called him. They started him. Okay. So, were you on the phone with Chandler and heard him yelling about being treated like a prisoner at his house? I think so. Yeah? Okay, tell me more about that. When he wasn't allowed to leave? And that was after the fall, right? When he was recovery slash payback two weeks for the money that he owes them? Yeah, that sounds familiar. What day was that? That he's still talking about being a prisoner? I don't know. Uh, Like recently? Just sounds familiar. Is that something that he normally complained about? Yeah, like, he's only allowed to leave when his parents let him leave, like, their house, their rules, like, if they didn't, if they wanted him home, they'd be like, no, you can't go. Everything about Kat's answer, the long pause before speaking, the glances around the room, and the vague answer are all red flags for signs of anxiety or concern. She seems uncomfortable and reluctant to speak negatively of him. However, she might also be glancing around because it's likely that Kat has many conversations with Chandler so she's not always going to recall exactly when each conversation took place. Additionally, the fact that she can't remember what day the conversation occurred could be an indication that this sort of situation happens often. In text messages between Chandler and Kat, it's clear that he felt his parents were overbearing. In one, Chandler tells Kat he told his mom, I won't be your prisoner anymore, and that, quote, she's actually trying to jail me when she knows I can be more comfortable somewhere else. 
In one instance, Chandler told Kat that she can't come over and he can't leave the house because he owes his parents $1,200. When Kat offers to Venmo him the money, he says he can't take it because his parents see the transactions. The next day, Chandler tells her that he's still on lockdown and Kat replies that she doesn't understand why his parents are being weird and selective on when she can see him. In an even more concerning series of messages, Chandler tells Kat that his mom wants him to go to the cabin, but he's going to tell her he has plans with Kat and threatens to end his own life. Kat replies cryptically that he's so close to freedom. Chandler then states that he's, quote, not going to tell them with you there. You don't have to be there to watch them hit me. Chandler might have conflict with his parents frequently where they forbid him from leaving the home. So Kat is maybe accustomed to Chandler complaining about this. As is, is his dad a strict father? You know, a lot of dads are really strict. Like, he's strict, but, like, he still makes jokes, laughs with them, like I said, fishes with them. The prisoner thing, I think he was just being dramatic. Like, so what kid wouldn't call their parent a prisoner if they're, like, not allowed to leave often? Or, like, they want to go do something, their parents are like, no, you know? Yeah. Like... That's just my perspective. I'm not trying to be like, oh, no, 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 no. it's like, it just sounds like a normal kid thing to say to me. Also, Chandler isn't a kid. He's 23 years old. However, even Kat is referring to him as a kid. It's as though she subconsciously recognizes his immaturity. While Kat wouldn't describe the Haldersons as overly strict parents, there's no telling how Chandler must have felt as their son. Based on the information she gave, they definitely seem overbearing and a little more involved in Chandler's life than the average parents would be given that he is in reality a grown man. It seems like they bossed him around and treated him like a child. As well, Chandler's parents may have been overbearing as a response to their son's personality, his immaturity and inability to face stressors like an adult. He clearly had severe emotional problems, such as a severe lack of assertiveness and poor anger control. Individuals raised in this kind of environment tend to be immature, are less self-motivated and self-reliant, and have trouble bouncing back when things don't go well. Do you guys think it's true or something? We're just making sure that we're... Okay, because you're asking a lot of questions about him. But I, that's what my friends and I are talking about. We're like, okay, he's like the only one who lives with them. So, and like, he's the only one I have a relationship with. Like, I'm not... You know, Caitlin, I'm not, I can't answer questions about Mitch. Right. But it's still like, it's like the best shock I will feel. And like, I, I think I'll just be so mentally f***ed up if like I find out he took that. Like, it just seems not Chandler at all. Yeah. It sounds like the once confident cat is starting to bend to the idea that Chandler had something to do with this. She's even beginning to imagine how she would feel if it were the truth. Kat is very animated and expressive. She seems to be using a lot of hand gestures here because being comedic seems to help her when talking about difficult or uncomfortable things. It seems like she falls back on humor to cope with stress or other emotions she might be feeling. So you don't think there's any way that um, Chandler's involved in the disappearance? No, I told Liz that like if it's Chandler, I'm going to be severely pissed off after this. Like, I just... I just can't see it being him. Like, As well, when she states that she doesn't think Chandler did it, her palms are up. Palms up is generally considered a low-confidence body position, meaning that she may be feeling unsure about this statement. If it was, would you, would you help him? No, I'm sorry. Excuse my French. Like, that's crazy. Like, I could... No. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I... I can't stand blood. Like, blood scares me. <laughs> like, dead bodies. Like, I was good at dissections, but, like, that's animals. But, like, killing people, especially, like, Mr. and Mrs. Hollerson, I'm sorry. That's, like, different levels of stuff. Okay. Like, I'm sorry that I'm freaking out now, but, like, mm -hmm. sorry. Like, mm -hmm. Her hand gestures here seem to get shaky. She's almost trying to push the officer's idea away as if she completely rejects the idea and wouldn't want to be associated with it. Also notice that she chuckles a few times. Again, it seems like she uses humor to get herself through stress, but here her distress has superseded her usual jovial and animated responses. 
She says she's freaking out, and that's definitely true. So you had nothing to do with their disappearance? No. You don't think Chandler did? No. You think anybody, Mitchell, you think he would have anything to do with it? No, I just can't see people wanting to hurt them. Like, that's the thing. Okay. So that's why we're so worried. Like, we don't know who would do this to them. What would the possibility be for us to take your cell phone and analyze it? We're trying to verify some things that... So you have all the timestamps. Sure. Right? So, I mean, you have all the pictures. So we have a guy that could download it while you're here. Like, you wouldn't have to leave it with us. So you can limit what he mm. looks at. I'm not gonna lie. So we, don't, we don't have we don't care about those. Okay. We don't. All we care about is the text messages from you, Chandler, Snapchat history, any social media stuff. And we're really just looking for probably what would you say the first until the first until today. July first until today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Locations on what she said. But yeah, if there's any like inappropriate photos, I totally don't care about those. Can I get a pinky? Pr- you can't break pinky promises, but it's only going to be from July 1st. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what you want. I would like a pinky on that. I can pinky you. Awesome. Her hesitancy could possibly be a cover-up for her not wanting detectives to see any incriminating evidence that could be in her phone. On the other hand, personal photos are a very feasible reason to be anxious about another person going through your device. She appears to take time to weigh the pros and cons before she ultimately decides to hand over her phone. So in cases like this, disappearance cases, things we like to do to people that especially like the house, challenge cells. We like to get consensual, what we call DNA, buckle swabs from people. It's not down the throat or up the nose. You don't want to draw blood or anything fun. It's I'm like, scared of needles so it's bad. Literally, you open your mouth. I rub one cheek or rub the other, and we're done. Maybe less than 10 seconds. That's your call. Just helps. Because obviously, we're, your DNA is probably going to be in the house, right? You were showering there. Yeah. Amazing. You know what I mean? So You'll see my hair on her hairbrush. Right. I used her hair dryer. So it's just like, we just got to say that you are the person that we're collecting. Fair enough. Yeah, I have one. I don't know if I want a sweaty binder one. Kat is given a sweaty binder buckle swab. All the while, the conversation with detectives drags on. She's not as conversational or energetic as she once was and her patience seems to be running low. She's very likely experiencing the onset of mental exhaustion, given that this interrogation has gone on for over three hours with no sign of wrapping up. Because Kat wasn't under arrest and not charged with any crime, she was entirely free to refuse the request to provide a sample. However, even when officers are fairly certain that they know who committed a crime, they will often perform evidence clearing where they take samples from people who aren't suspects in order to clear them of the crime and to determine the origin of any unknown samples. This happens for many things like DNA, fingerprints, blood types, and even footprints. As far as her phone is concerned, there is also a right to refuse surrendering a phone to law enforcement. In Kat's case, if she refuses a phone search or a DNA swab, the only recourse investigators would have is to obtain a warrant for both. It's unclear that investigators would have had enough evidence to show probable cause for either warrant. An attorney would advise you to always refuse to give a DNA sample or provide access to your electronic devices. Even if a person isn't a suspect, it's highly likely the sample will end up in the FBI's CODIS database, the Combined DNA Index System. This can later be used to match newly found and unknown DNA samples to known records for a positive match and gives the police state a greater ability to ensnare both guilty and innocent alike in any possible future investigation. It can also work retroactively, so that once you submit that sample, it may match up to previously obtained unknown samples, leading to additional legal headaches. It's better, whenever possible, to simply remain off the radar. While DNA matches are generally considered to be as perfect a match as you can get, 
sloppy evidence collection can easily entangle innocent people in rather serious investigations. CODIS hit a milestone in 2021, with 20 million records now in the system. As of April 2021, CODIS was used in about 550,000 investigations, not something anyone would want to be innocently caught up in. Do we know when China's going to be done? Yeah, um, I mean, since they're done. Yeah. They, um, felt like he's not quite as cooperative as you. Okay. Any reason why? why? It's probably worried you guys are going to be like, can't we get it? Okay. Do you know? I think that's everyone's fear. Yeah. Like, no one wants to be accused of killing their parents. I'm also, I think, just a very understanding person that I look for the best at everything. Okay, but no. Um, well, right now, because he's not being so cooperative or forthcoming, his parents are missing. It looks like they're going to take him into custody. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. I don't know what the charges are yet, but um, right now it's just going to be because of the missing person's investigation and him lying, lying to the detectives. Uh, why he's lying, I mean, I, you know, we're all wondering. Um, right. You probably know him best. Why do you? Why do you think he's not being truthful? Just want to pin on him, I guess. Can I talk to him before he goes or no? Mm-mm. I think I've already walked him down. <laughs> why? That's great. I mean, you've been super cooperative and trying to get your phone back. If it's not going to be done anytime soon. We can get you a ride somewhere. Has someone pick you up? Can I get a ride back to Chandler? That's where my car is. And I'm so meet his brother there. That's going to be something else. I'm glad you said that. So they're probably going to want to leave. They're, they're going to leave your car there. No. At the house because he was in it all weekend. Mm, no. I'm sorry. And I have places to be. That's my car. Like, if I'm being cooperative, why do you have to take my car? Because Chandler's not, and he was in your car. So there's chance that there's DNA in there that we need to get. But don't we have to, like, consent to that? Or you need, like, a court order or something? Oh, because it's at his house. They're looking, at, they're looking at writing a warrant at the house. So if they write a warrant at the house, your car's in the driveway, they're going to want because he was in there. Cat appears pretty fed up at this point both with the extensive questioning and the detective's demands. Seeing as she still has work and school to get to, she's reasonably devastated about having to hand over her car. It's not easy or fun to feel like you're being punished for being cooperative by having your things confiscated. It's important to note that a search warrant must be specific about the places to be searched and the items to be seized. However, this specificity requirement doesn't have to be as precise as some people think. For example, a warrant may give officers the right to search a house, attached buildings, e.g. garage, and any vehicles on the property. The key issue here would be how vehicles were listed on the warrant. The warrant may actually name her car specifically, or it may be more generic, such as vehicles on the property. If it's sufficiently generic and could be interpreted to include her car, then it's legitimately a subject to search, impound, and process for evidence. Perhaps the thought of having her clothing and the vehicle that transports her to her job makes Kat feel like there are still pieces of her life that are real and reliable. After all, she's likely still registering the fact that the guy she's been dating for two years isn't the person she thought he was, and that this major aspect of her life was a lie. She has every right to be mentally and emotionally fatigued, and this fatigue could be what's making her push back against the detectives. So there's like no way I can talk to him at all. Upstairs. Is that where the like jail is? Yeah, the area. So, what exactly did detectives find that led to Chandler's sudden arrest? The answer isn't easy to stomach. The same afternoon that Chandler was being interrogated police received groundbreaking information from none other than Kat's mother, Dolce, and her girlfriend, Cress. Dolce told police that she thought Chandler's behavior had been strange lately, and she'd actually begun to believe he was using some kind of narcotic. Oddly, an officer also described Chandler's pupils as looking like pinpoints, 
But this wasn't the only story she had to tell. On Monday, July 5th, Chandler visited the farm without Cat and asked Cress if he could use her pool, to which Cress consented. Both her and Dolce were present at the farm that day, and not long after Chandler walked away from the house and disappeared towards the pool, the couple resolved to go for a swim as well. The two hopped on Cress's tractor and made their way across the field towards the pool. However, as they rode along, they saw no sign of Chandler. What they did see through the open doors of the large barn was Chandler's car. The car was parked on the opposite side of the barn, near the wooded area of the farm. Once they got closer, they could see that the trunk was open and Chandler wasn't anywhere in sight. After a minute, they simply continued on their way to the pool. A few minutes later, while they were swimming, they both spotted Chandler walking along the edge of the woods near where his car was parked. He walked away from the tree line and directly towards them. Once he got into the pool, the women noticed that he seemed to splash his chest, arms, and face with the water, as if washing himself off. Then, after staring off into space for a few moments, Chandler left suddenly. Cress made a haunting comment to police, stating that she had recently noticed something strange, vultures circling the woods on the property. Police inspected the woods near where Chandler had been seen, and it wasn't long before they made their first gut-churning discovery, a male human torso. The arms and head were completely missing, and the legs were cut off above the knee. Just as disturbing, Chandler had described that his father wore those cheesy dad joke shirts, and the torso was found still wearing a t-shirt with a joke about sarcasm on it. Investigators also found several cutting tools, including scissors, a saw, bolt cutters, and a long blade, discarded in an empty oil drum by the barn. This was enough to charge Chandler with his father's murder. Interestingly, the medical examiner would later note that there were noticeable differences in the marks left by the tools used to dismember the torso, which could possibly indicate that more than one person made the marks. However, his mother Krista was still missing. She wouldn't remain missing for long, though. In fact, Kat would be the one to lead police to Krista about a week later. Um, anything you want to tell us right away? Um, so, when we met yesterday, um, when, because I, I have been keeping up with the media, I haven't been watching any of the trials for my own mental health, <laughs> and he was catching me up. Notice here how she's now cuddling with the stuffed animal, clearly in distress and seeking a comfort tool, even though it's an item typically considered childish. It also provides a bit of a barrier between herself and the detectives, who are tearing her world apart as they find out the truth. When the Wisconsin River was mentioned, mm -hmm. I, like, we were mulling over it. I was. And um, I recalled, like, taking a screenshot of him near the Wisconsin River because we share Snapchat locations with each other. Mm -hmm. And he, like, wasn't responding to me, wasn't responding to me, always snaps me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just have it putting him there at July 3rd at, like, in the morning. Okay. It's from Snapchat. I don't know if you just that, but um, that's him by the Wisconsin River off of Gulf Road. Okay. And that's the 8 on it. Okay. in the morning. Sure. And then my phone always tells me what day it is. So uh -huh. It's July 3rd, 8.58 a.m. Okay. And I'm placed in there four minutes before, so 54. Okay. Have you been to that spot? Um, Do you know? I don't know if it's that specific spot, but we used to swim on the Wisconsin River. Okay. And, um... Like, it's one of the spots we would just go to, mm -hmm. and, like, I've only been there, like, maybe three times, okay. but he's gone swimming there a couple times. Because, okay. um, uh, you know, when you use Snapchat, when you open up the app, like, mm -hmm. open up the app, that's when it's going to update your location. Mm -hmm. If you don't open up the app, your location won't update at all. Mm -hmm. And, um... I was like, hey, where you at? Where you at? Like, you're not responding to me on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. And, like, um, we ended up calling, and he just said, like, he was in a dead zone. I was like, what are you doing out there, you know? Mm -hmm. I, was, I think over the phone, I was like, are you, like, swimming, like, in, in the Wisconsin River after his fall? Like, that's not safe. Mm -hmm. What did he say he was doing? He said he was um, running errands to get CBD. Okay. And 
13. Yeah, he said that's where his guy was, like, because they were going to give it to him for free or something. Okay. So he could just try it out. So he said his guy was going to meet him where his location was? Like, No, he right. was driving. He was driving. Okay. So I think he, it was all overhaul, like, a couple okay. weeks ago. But he, I think he was trying to say, like, he was driving back. And um, so he never says he's actually there for a period of time where his location is, by the No, oh. but um, when you're in a car, it shows you in a little car driving. Mm -hmm. So if he was moving, it would have said that. Okay. And he wasn't. No, his okay. location was just sitting there standing. And that means he's... Sure. Krista's remains were found by the Wisconsin River in the area where Cat Ping Chandler's location on July 3rd. Most disturbing of all was that when the police arrived in the area, they noted that it appeared familiar. During their investigation, they had noticed a photo of Chandler leaning against a distinct-looking elm tree. They soon discovered that same tree in the area, and approximately 100 yards behind the tree Chandler was photographed with were Krista's remains. Not only that, but the text that Chandler got from his mom on Sunday, July 4th was examined. As Chandler points out in his interrogation video, Krista had sent him a text saying that they were fine and that they would be attending the Independence Day parade that day. The date that this text was sent, July 4th, was inconsistent with the fact that this big annual parade had actually taken place the day before, on July 3rd. When police tracked Krista's phone back to where it was when she sent that text, her phone was nowhere near the family cabin or anywhere in Langlade County. In fact, Krista's phone showed itself to be located inside of her house. After this discovery, police later found Krista's phone in the garage, wrapped in tinfoil and stuffed inside of a hidden shoe. All signs pointed to Chandler having been the one to send that text message to himself. He was almost immediately hit with additional charges concerning the murder and dismemberment of his mother. There's no evidence to suggest the cat was ever involved in or even aware of the murders of Bart and Krista Halderson, and she has since been cleared of all suspicion. Cat was just another victim of Chandler's convoluted web of lies, and she wasn't the only one. Quite frankly, everything Chandler had told everyone around him about his life was a complete lie. Chandler had been attending Madison College, but he had stopped attending classes over a year ago and never told anyone. He'd even pretended to be a Madison College administration member and communicated with his parents, both over email and over the phone. This was all to make it appear to his parents that he was still enrolled. There was never a job waiting for him at SpaceX. He'd never secured an apartment in Florida with plans to move himself and Cat there. He very likely faked the fall or caused the fall on purpose right before he was scheduled to leave for Florida in order to avoid facing that lie. He'd never been on a police scuba diving team, but what he'd certainly done was manage to convince everyone in his life that this was his reality. It's worthy to note that pathological lying and conning behavior such as this can be signs of psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder. It's also a fact that narcissists tend to be quite grandiose and tell stories about themselves that don't fit reality. To a narcissist, the idea of being normal or like others is intolerable. Naturally, these individuals will also act to protect their fantasy lives. However, going to the extreme of committing murder is atypical, but of course, there are always exceptions. Unbeknownst to the people around him, Chandler's false life started long before this incident. Interviews with ex-associates and former partners of Chandler's revealed that he was a longtime compulsive liar and serial cheater. He told a lot of people different stories about where he worked, who he was, and about his relationship status. There's evidence that suggests that he'd had intimate contact with both men and women over the last year, with the latest tryst occurring just two months prior to his parents' disappearance. One of the girls that Chandler dated told the police that he claimed his mother once faked having a stroke to prevent him being able to leave the house and grounded him for an entire summer after he came home with a hickey. While she wasn't sure if he was lying about these outlandish claims, she was able to tell police that Chandler seemed to resent his father for not stepping up when his mother was overbearing with him and claimed that he never did anything on his behalf. In another instance, Chandler texted a friend about being caught cheating on a girlfriend, though it's unclear if he's talking about Kat. 
He told his friend that his girlfriend was going to call the other girl to confront her and find out what happened. Chandler then asks for his friend to answer the call instead and use a voice-changing app to make his voice sound female. Interestingly, there's evidence that Chandler was also caught by his parents using a voice changer to try to talk to them from his fake job. This was just one of the many instances where Chandler was caught in a lie. According to one of Chandler's ex-girlfriends, Dakota, he'd been seeing both her and Kat at the same time. Though he told Dakota that Kat was just a friend, they both confronted him. While Kat forgave him, Dakota did not. One of my close friends used to be his ex. We all thought he was this awful, horrible person. And then, like, I finally met him in person, and I was like, oh, we both really like Star Wars. Still, she had some very interesting things to tell police. Like many others, she attested to Chandler talking about his mother being overbearing and over-involved in his life. Even more noteworthy, though, was that Dakota also said that Chandler claimed he'd been to a doctor and diagnosed as a psychopath, telling her, quote, makes sense now, doesn't it? But Dakota wasn't the only one that Chandler made this claim to as well. One of his friends and ex-roommates, Alexander, described Chandler as a pathological liar, cold-hearted, and emotionally distanced. Not only did Alexander suspect that Chandler stole money from him while they were living together, but that while proclaiming his innocence, Chandler made an eerie comment that he could look for the money in his safe, but also, quote, don't judge me for what you find. Alexander never looked in the safe, likely because on one occasion, Chandler told him that he thought he might be a sociopath. Most people who knew Chandler had no clue of the reality of his life. That is, until Bart uncovered one of his son's secrets. He'd begun to suspect that his son was lying about his education after noticing several grammatical errors in the emails Chandler said he received from school staff, as well as several other red flags. Some of the red flags included a meeting with someone from Chandler's college being canceled, so someone else named Daniel Spieth called Bart. Bart later told Krista that the person he talked to sounds just like Chaz, the nickname Chandler's parents used for him. Police would later discover that the email accounts of Daniel Spieth had the same birth date as Chandler and that the sign-in phone number was the same as Chandler's cell phone. Still, Bart didn't know this at the time. He attempted on a few occasions to gently confront Chandler about some of his lies and even emailed him saying, did you email HR to inquire about your paycheck? Unless there's something you were not telling us, they have had ample time to pay you. So he posed as his son, called the school, and asked for a copy of his unofficial transcripts and was told he wasn't a student there. Hi, um, I'm trying to get an appointment scheduled to meet with somebody um, to mainly just get a copy of the transcript and also a printed copy of a certificate that was earned and and you know other degree verification. Do you have your old account info? Like you used to be Holderson C at Madison College. Well, how far back does that account go that you're looking at? Like when was the first class taken? 18. Spring of 2018. So I don't see that you were admitted in any program. You said they were, you know, it's the IT degrees in there, right? No, those are just classes. You might have just took the classes but not be in the program. Was the internship from the spring shop in there? No. Okay, thank you for your help. Bart told Chandler that they'd both be attending a meeting up at his school that was scheduled for July 1st, the same evening that Chandler had supposedly helped his parents pack up their things for their weekend getaway. When it was time to head off to their meeting the evening of the 1st, before he and Bart could walk outside to the car, Chandler killed him. Bart was killed by a gunshot wound to the head. It's fair to assume that after that, he waited for his mother to get home from work and killed her too. It's still unclear exactly how Krista died. Yet even after Chandler's arrest, the case took a strange turn. Given Kat's reaction during her interview, you may be surprised to know that following Chandler being charged, he and Kat stayed in contact. While in jail, Chandler used a jail messenger app to text Kat, and the two also spoke frequently on the phone. 
Their conversations reveal a different side of Kat than the one we saw during the interrogations. On September 9th, 2021, Chandler texted Kat saying, Good morning, wifey. Today is court, so I'm sorry if you have to hear about it. Kat responded, Good morning, hubby. I love you and everything is going to be okay. Just do your hair, wear your glasses, and show people you don't look like a monster like how they're trying to say you are on the news. Remember to relax and don't be too intense. The two made plans to buy an espresso machine and save so they had money for when they both attended school and shop for new clothes when Chandler got out of jail. Chandler was optimistic that not only would he be out of prison soon, but that he would be able to get a job quickly. He also messaged her saying that, I got you still and that's all I need. In calls from prison, Chandler was able to speak with Kat and her mother on the phone. Are you going to stay there until January? Um, I don't know about myself. Um, I'm in a mental health pod, so they might put me in general population eventually. But if trying I, to stay there. Oh, yeah, I will. It's more safe for you, you know? Yeah. I can't, if you go to the population, try to, to stay away from other people, you know? Yeah. Um, and sometimes it is better to say what happened. Like, if you don't say what are you there for, people thinking that you are there for something else, maybe. I don't want you to be hurt. Well, don't worry, yeah. about it. I'm all on the TV, so everyone knows I actually belong in jail. <laughs> oh, okay. And no one's going to be picking on the switch, so don't worry. Oh, okay. Oh. Plus, if you know of Dane County Prison, anywhere that I would be housed, just given what they're thinking of me, like I'm a crazy person, I'm going to have my own room, and I won't really have to worry about other people. I appreciate you worrying about me and caring for me. I know, yeah, the news has made it sound very bad, but just talking to my lawyers and everything is not, it's much different. The news has putting a, a very bad spin on everything. I know. I hope you know that. I don't know what happened, and I don't need Everybody oh, has their you. own reason, huh? I definitely can't talk about the case over the phone. Right, right. But I, I wanted to tell you that I, everybody has their own thing. In a text, Chandler tells Kat, It's a lot to have to read what people say about me. Not super fun. But I understand that a lot of people are angry and or sad. And it's super easy to blame everything on me at this point in the case. Kat tells him, Everyone is pointing fingers, and it's a lot easier to point at you instead of imagining what else could have happened. In another call, Chandler and Kat discuss his next court appearance. I think they're delaying everything as much as they can, so we don't have time to prepare. Well, got your glasses, got your colored pencils to highlight important things. I don't think I would last in jail. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> yeah. Not well, mentally. Other than that, I, I seem to be doing it pretty well. Well, I'm uh, happy. I was worried you're gonna get beat up or something. Mm, no, people stay clear of me. Hey. Yeah, I would too. And this guy's, you know, I like yours. That's crooked. Maybe I can get beat up in here and someone will punch it so hard it fixes itself. I love you and I miss you. Stop. <laughs> love I love you. you. Even after Chandler's incarceration, Kat continued to foot the bill for him. In their jail messages, they talked about how Kat had paid Chandler's lawyers. He thanks her and texts back, Oof, sorry, hun. You'll be well compensated when I'm out. At one point, they discuss maybe selling some of Chandler's drawings that he's created while in prison, and he messages her saying, I'm drawing a bit more than I used to. Maybe you could sell my pictures to someone and make money for your mattress. 
They're not good pictures, but I'm apparently famous, or rather infamous at this point. I don't know, just an idea that might help you out. You could sell them and who knows, it could get you something nice. Cat responds. LOL, wishing you the best of luck with the love letter. If I sell the photos, I'm just scared people are going to find out I'm the girlfriend, and I really don't want to deal with that right now. One of the reasons for moving was due to a reporter showing up to the house and a not-so-good experience. Chandler answers, You know I can't talk over this, baby. If anything, I'd have lawyers catch you up. And Cat texts back, I know it's not in your best interest to talk about it over the jail app, LOL. The last message we can see exchanged between the two was from Cat on September 30th, 2021, reading, Hey, since you didn't call, I'm going to assume something happened. I hope you're okay and safe and are able to sleep well tonight. I love you a lot. It's unclear why Kat continued communication with Chandler after his arrest. Perhaps she was in denial. After all, it was a huge pill to swallow. The idea that her boyfriend had so barbarically slayed both of his parents was unthinkable. However, before the trial rolled around, Kat experienced a change of heart. She'd accepted that Chandler's life was a complete and utter lie though the details of how or when exactly this occurred are unknown. Chandler pleaded not guilty in September of 2021. However, he refused to talk to his appointed lawyers about the case or testify at his own trial. His trial began in January, and due to his lack of cooperation and the pile of evidence against him, the case was practically open and shut. Among the evidence gathered was surveillance footage from a Fleet Farm department store that showed Chandler purchasing a tarp. This tarp would also later be found on the farm, rolled up and discarded in a garbage can. Also found on Cress's property was a white plastic grocery bag at the bottom of a recycling bin. Inside the bag, there were several balled-up paper towels, which were covered in a substance that appeared to be old, dried blood. In addition, Chandler was caught on surveillance camera picking up some large bags of ice from a Target store on July 3rd and from Quick Trip on July 1st. Chandler's internet search history also ended up being one of the biggest clues to his involvement. On July 7th, less than a week after his parents went missing, Chandler searched for body found in Wisconsin, woman's body found in Wisconsin, Wisconsin dismembered body found, dead body found in Wisconsin, Body found in Milwaukee River 2021, and Bart and Krista. Through the investigation, neighbors also provided some damning evidence. One claimed to have smelled burning wood followed by an odor of barbecued meat in the air on the night of July 1st. Another neighbor provided security camera footage that showed a flickering light emanating from the Halderson home during the very early morning hours of July 2nd from approximately midnight until about 4.30 a.m. Only one question remains. Where had Chandler stored the bodies while Kat was over for the weekend? It appears we may never know. Further investigation of the Holderson's home uncovered the presence of more than 200 bone fragments in the fireplace. The use of a blue light exposed traces of blood in front of the fireplace and on the basement floor of the home that had been cleaned, just as Chandler had reported. However, the amount of blood present was way more than anything a cut on the toe, a nosebleed, or scratches could have produced. Then, of course, there's the fact that in the days following their disappearances, Chandler was spotted in both areas where his parents' remains were discovered. The jury would deliberate for only two hours, after which they would find Chandler Holderson guilty of the intentional homicide of his parents, Bart and Krista Holderson. He was also found guilty of two counts of giving false information regarding a missing person and two counts of mutilating a body. Chandler requested not to be present at his sentencing, but his request was denied and he was forced to attend. At his sentencing on March 17, 2022, Chandler's defense team pleaded for the possibility of parole, but the judge would state that in order to fulfill his duty of ensuring the safety of the public, he had to hand down a sentence that would guarantee that Chandler would never walk the streets again. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Chandler only had one thing to say at his sentencing. He made a brief statement saying that he planned to appeal the verdict and that if any criminal lawyers were watching and wanted to take on his case, 
they should reach out to him as soon as possible. And he wasn't kidding. On March 30th, 2023, Chandler submitted a notice of no merit appeal for his conviction. This is exactly what it sounds like, an appeal filed by a lawyer who doesn't believe there's actual reasonable grounds for an appeal. Chandler is currently serving his life sentence at the Dodge Correctional Institute in Waupon, Wisconsin.